In this episode, we speak to Brent Hagen, my dad. It's as raw and vulnerable and honest as it gets between a father and son. We share things that we haven't spoken to each other about, nor anyone else. This is a conversation that was years in the making. And just a warning, this episode contains personal stories of abuse, suicide, and mental health. Dad? Elliot? <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling? Yep. Just a touch. A touch? Yeah. Yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah. Probably a conversation I should have had about 50 years ago. That's right. We're going we're gonna to get it done today. Mm. Um, you're going to feel a lot better. So I've got, I've got a few memories uh, from my childhood that let's say if I'm in the car driving alone, it's pretty hard not to start crying. And I'm going to share two of those memories with you now. Yep. The first one is when we all went back to New Zealand on a family holiday. Yep. And we saw, saw where you grew up, saw where you lived, um, saw the relatives, the cousins, the aunties and uncles and went skiing in Queenstown. And, you know, when you're a kid, it was, it was, it's still such a good memory and a good holiday. But as I've gotten older, I've realised that there was probably an ulterior motive to going there. And I remember sitting in mum's parents' place. I always thought mum, when she says goodbye to people, she always gets emotional. And I, from my point of view, it was a bit of an awkward silence. And they're all looking at each other. And I'm thinking, what's, what's going on here? And then mum gets up and hugs her mum. And they just start crying. And as you're a kid, I just thought mum was just being emotional, saying goodbye. I probably didn't realise that might have been the last time she would see her mum. I think a lot of that is right, but it also comes back to lost time, lost opportunities. Mm. I mean, I left for my reasons, which were different to hers. Mm. She left probably because I did and didn't really think why she was going to leave and probably never thought for one moment that she wasn't going to go back. Mm. So... I think once we had kids, her thoughts were she's missed out or our kids, you guys, have missed out on so much family opportunity. And I think that makes her tearful. She's, you know, you kids have missed out on a gra- on grandparents from both sides. So that's always tearful. She knows we weren't probably going to go back too often and that very well may have been the case. But I just think short term, um, I don't know whether she thought that. I don't think... Because she was sick. Was, her, was she sick? Yeah. Then? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's well, what maybe, I found out later that... that that she was sick okay. with breast cancer, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that might have been the last time that she could see her mum alive because she kind of knew that she was sick. She yeah, knew yeah, she yeah. wasn't going to get back there yeah, anytime yeah. soon. So I, th- I think about that and just how she just had to get on with the holiday, get on with the trip, get in the car with you and the kids and just leave and then just put on a brave face and continue with the holiday, knowing I just know that would have been so hard for her to do that. We had that conversation. We have it regularly, and we probably had it three days ago. Mm. I don't know what inspired it, but we talked. None of my family or her family got invited to our wedding mm. because I couldn't invite mine. And for some illogical reason, I said, Well, if I can't invite mine, do you want to invite yours? Maybe not. Where we just said three days ago, God, I wish we invited your parents. Mm. I had my issues to deal with, and I sort of enforced them on her when I shouldn't have done. Mm. Um, and but that's I think I think the end of the day whether she thought it was the last time we're going to see her, she was going to see her parents I think it was I think it was the missed opportunities you had with you know cousins uh, I think that's what may always made her tearful leaving didn't make me mm. but it always made her and the other memory I've got and I know you're going to know this straight away years later when. I moved to New Zealand to play rugby and you and mum came over and visited us and we actually caught up with your dad's brother and we all sat down and had lunch together and he's quite, he was quite old but at the same time I, he seemed really um, unsettled, he seemed really anxious, he looked like he's seen a ghost. I was kind of aware of it and I was thinking, oh, he, he doesn't look... He doesn't look right seeing you. And we all sat down at the at the table to start lunch. And before anyone said anything, he said to you, I'm really sorry I didn't know he was doing that to you. I'm really sorry I didn't know. And you put your hand on his hand and said, hey, hey, it's okay. It's fine. I remember that as clear as you do. Mm. 
And I remember the detail we went into as to what happened, and it was the wrong place, right time, but he was on a roll. It was the last time I was going to see him. He was he was in a home then, wasn't he? We'd mm. got him out. Yeah, and yeah, it was emotional. I, I wish it hadn't happened there because the whole family was... Well, maybe the whole family had to hear it. I'm not sure. I'm a, I'm a bit, you know, I, I like privacy and I like having those discussions away from the rest of the family. I like protecting the family and it... I thought about it afterwards, maybe you guys shouldn't have heard what was said, but it was, and that's, mm. yeah, it was un- sort of uncomfortable. But So can you take us and describe us what he was referring to? I think he had found out through Michelle, certainly not, th- maybe through Royce. Royce had actually gone over and I think he had gone into detail. Your oldest brother. Yeah, mm. about the violence that we had to go through. Mm-hmm how it was just premeditated and deliberate and uh, how alcohol was the major reason for it. He tried to justify it, I think. Someone tried to justify it. I'm guessing it was him or their side of the family that Dad went through turmoil turmoil on the war. Mm. Um, He was in a truck and it got blown up and he survived and his, his, his offsider, who I think at the time was the brother of his girlfriend back in in Bacargill. Mm-hmm. This is all a blur. A lot of the stuff I'm, we're going to talk about is like throwing a reel of film into a fire and you get bits out. Mm. Some of it's burnt, doesn't exist, some of it's still there. Mm. My stuff might be broken and out of context, but that's the memory I've got. Um, and, and I and he's, we both sort of started to um, justify some of his behaviour through... Your, your dad's behaviour? Yeah, yeah, through experience in the war. Mm. But I think he knows a bit of what he did. I don't think he knows the graphic details and how bad it was. I think he just thinks it was just alcoholic, domestic violence, surface stuff, mm. you know, a few hidings and... Yeah, not but me, you, you yeah. could almost tell, though, that he knew probably a lot more just by his demeanour to you. Yeah. It, it didn't seem like how he reacted and how he, he, we saw, like he saw you on that, on that day we're having lunch, it was... It, I think deep down he kind of knew that something bad. I would find it difficult to believe he left in Chicago. I can't remember at what age, but if my father had been like that for a long time, I can't think that he wouldn't have had a feeling mm. the extent it got to. So I guess it was one of those things. It was um, the worst keep secret. Mm. Back in those days, everyone knew everything, and I suspect they all knew what was happening, but Baltimore... You don't mention the word. So can you take us back to your childhood and and maybe go into detail about um, yeah. your, your upbringing? And so as I said, I don't have a good, solid memory of my upbringing. I know we were born in Winton. And there's various moments that, good moments that I remember, which are few and far between. You know, you first start school and it's snowing on winter on Christmas Day. They're the good times. I don't remember anything else. I remember moving to Invercargill. I think my first primary school was there. I don't ever remember a time, of all my memories, I don't remember a time when the the abuse wasn't there. But it was drinking. Sober, he was a good bloke. It was just the alcohol that cut in. And and we find out stuff that he was vindictive and it was sort of uh, a rebound marriage and the guy that got killed... I understand, I'd like to be corrected on it, but I understand, as I said, it was the brother of the girlfriend he had mm. and he'd got the Dear John phone call or letter saying the marriage, the relationship has broken up, he's come back, met mum and it was a rebound thing and mm. and there were things in mum's life that he kept bringing up. Mum, her mother gave birth to mum when she was young and no, wasn't married and that was a forbidden thing back then. So mum being called a bastard was one of the classic instigators of violence. That mm. would always be something that would be thrown out. Mm. So, you know, that was how things started. So did the drinking start after he got back from... Don't know. Don't I, know. We probably didn't go that deep. I, mm. I don't think mum knew him before he went to war, probably. Um, it was just always in in our life, so I don't know when it started. I don't I don't think she knows what he was like before mm. they went to war. So your memories of him has always been drinking. Yeah, it's was, it was always been drinking, mm. and it's always been you know broken eggshells, um, no no eye contact, 
um, go to your room, don't be seen mm. when he was in his mood. And it was always drinking. He would never come home from work. Um, those days, drinking, driving was accepted, I think. And he knew his, his office was beside the police station, so I don't think he ever got... He knew them all, so... Mm. You knew after work it was on. Every day? It, um, when he'd been drinking, it was every day. Early in the morning, he was a good bloke because he wouldn't have started drinking till about 11. Mm. But you, you, we, we got to know the triggers when it was on. Um, he'd stand up, take his glasses off, and you knew it was on. So we just had to make ourselves scarce and get out. So how old were you then? I guess if I'm remembering it, I, I, I'm, I'm, I suppose it's probably at high school, say 13, 14. I don't think at any stage... When he'd been drinking, it, it wasn't on. But in the weekends, if we got him early in the morning, it was a worthwhile conversation. Yeah. And, and I guess to a certain extent, I was the, if there's such a thing as survivor guilt, I've probably got that because I did the things that he thought were good. I played the rugby, so I probably got away with a bit more than the others. Tried to please him a bit more so you wouldn't... I don't think I was ever pleasing him. I yeah. never did it to please. Mm. Never. I don't recall ever doing it. I did it because I wanted to do it. Mm. And I wanted to do it because I wanted to get out of the house. That was mm. one of my mechanisms of avoiding contact was to play as much sport as possible. So you wouldn't have to be at home? I wouldn't have to be home. Mm. And sleepovers, I'd find reasons to start someone's house. Or, And lucky enough, I played, made rec teams, so I was always away somewhere doing any number of sports. So that was my escape mechanism. So how how bad did it did the abuse get? Well, the abuse started, I, I suppose, was just the hidings, uh, the visual hidings around the house. But then, for some reason, there was a trigger that it meant he had to be vindictive. So if it was a hiding with a bell, it would be vinegar poured on the cuts just to make it worse. I'm not going to go into details of things my family have said that they recount because I never saw it. But, you know, I, I recall uh, the continuous raping of my wife, of mum. Oh, my bedroom was there, so I, I knew it was. I heard the screams and the yells and the con- conversation. So, so it was that sort of stuff. It wasn't just I'm drunk and, and verbal abuse and the odd backhander. It was actually just nasty, vindictive, and that's the broken part. I, I think it's got to be worse than post traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if that goes that deep. Mm-hmm. And I think my, my, my there's three boys, and I think the middle boy, my middle brother, I think he got the worst of it. He suffered badly, you know, from wed beating, uh, uh, bed wetting to not doing well at school. So and it wasn't just physical, he was probably getting mental, mental abuse. It oh, was completely non-stop, yeah, yeah. non-stop, non-stop. But the physical stuff was bad for him. I mean, he, yeah. he, he, he was a bed wetter, so my father thought the best idea of doing that was to put a rubber band around his penis, to mm. stop him wetting the bed. So we're talking that sort of violence. So it was... And that's 13, 14, 15 yeah, years old. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. And what I've seen of post-traumatic stress disorder, he maybe sat, suffered depression and he was struggling to deal with his own demons, but to go that next step further, to inflict that on other people, and it be premeditated. Yeah, it sounds like it wasn't just a short fuse where he lost control. It kind of like seems like he, he really had a... It was direct? Yeah. It was intentional. And I think he challenged or inflicted the most pain on the person he thought he could get away with. I'm not sure how my oldest brother, I don't know what abuse he received outside the normal... Hidings. Hidings. Mm. I really don't know that, but I know my, my <coughs> other brother received the most. Mm. Um, and, and, and my older sister, I know myself and my younger sister, we probably survived. If that's survival, I don't know. We got what we got, mm. but in comparison to what the others received, probably was worse. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it was just the case of uh, me having to find ways, and I was probably, I was better at finding ways of avoiding it than my other brother was. He got a job where he was spending a lot of the time away from home, but when he came home, I resented it because I knew it was on for no reason. I don't even think, I don't even think alcohol started it then. I think because the mere fact he was in the house... And I resented that because when he wasn't in the house and my oldest brother and oldest sister had left at that stage, it wasn't too bad because I played the sports that he liked mm. to watch and I got out of the house. Well, so you reckon your dad had it out for... Yeah, he had it out. So when he wasn't there, it wasn't too bad, but when he was there, it was, it was on. It got to the stage as we grew a bit older. He had left school, got a job. I got out. Uh, he'd got out. He left school early. 16, 17, got a job as a jockey. He stayed away from home a lot, but there was times he came home. 
Mm. And then it was on non-stop, mm. pretty much. I don't know why he came back on those occasions, but he did. And it got the better of him, didn't it? Yeah, he committed suicide. He always tried to please him. I, I guess I, I never consciously did, but probably I did because I played rugby and made rep teams. He thought it was a good idea and he was probably happy for me to do that. But Gary absolutely was the classic, I have to please him. My father was a plumber and he followed that line. He got a job as a plumber and Dad got him a job. He got him the job as a plumber. So that was always something that surprised me because I never did at any stage of my life think I want to make him happy. I never did anything to please him. And he went back to my father's funeral. So when he, he, so my father committed suicide as well. My mum was diagnosed with cancer and she had a couple of months to live at the time. She had been diagnosed two years previous and she had been in hospices and homes and been in care. And it was getting close. I think she had another couple of months to live. And my, Gary had gone back and warned him, when mum dies, I'm coming back for you. And then a month later, he committed suicide. Mm. Your brother did? Uh, no, my father Your did. Your father did? Yeah. So my brother was still alive. Your brother was still alive, yeah. And uh, my father committed suicide. Yeah. So the understanding was, and you know, this is just conversation, that he did it because he knew his days were numbered. And I know my brother and I had this conversation because I heard him say it and went, mate, Seriously? Mm. Yeah, I've spoken to the guys. I've, who's going to do it? So once your, your dad was gone, Gary was still... He was seriously broken. Yeah. He had a few relationships. I never saw him drunk. I don't think he needed to drink. I think he was just so broken. Mm. Um, he couldn't see the forest for the trees. He turned into a bit of a criminal. He robbed a, a bottle shop, I think it was. We flew down. He got caught. We flew down to the court case. Um, he got, I can't remember the sentence, I don't think he went to prison, I'm pretty sure he didn't, he might have just got home detention or whatever it was, mm. uh, I can't remember. But we went down to the court case, he did have a relationship with a girl I think, I recall, who lived on a farm and he tended horses and because he had that jockey history um, and that's where he committed suicide out at their farm. So he was never settled, he had a couple of relationships, he did get married but that didn't work. Yeah. Um, he had another relationship that didn't work, and then the third one. And I understand there was violence in those relationships as well. So he couldn't seem to break the cycle of violence. Um, it was something he, I don't know how mentally that works, mm. that he couldn't break it. It stayed with him. And you spoke earlier that it was a small town and everyone sort of knows each other. Did you keep it? Could you keep it a secret? Is that something that. I was embarrassed. Was it, well, yeah. I, I was embarrassed because I, I didn't see it from any other part of our family. Whether it happened behind closed doors, I don't know. But our neighbours were the type of people who wouldn't have done it, I'm pretty sure. And the screaming and the yelling and the pain and suffering that they would have heard always embarrassed me. And even when I stayed on sleepovers, I would make myself scarce. I would stay at friends' places. And once again, I'm not going to judge because I don't know what goes behind closed doors. But... I, You'd think if it was a regular occurrence, even me being present wouldn't have stopped that father getting drunk and I would have seen a bit of it somewhere because I stayed over regularly. Most weekends, I wouldn't be home. Yeah. So I would have seen it happening at someone else's house, house and I never saw it. But everyone was protected. I know my, my relatives protected him. They, never, they knew about it but never once came to our defence. So that's sort of something that's been left with me. Yeah. With regards to my existing relatives, they never supported us as a family. How did it affect your school, going to school, in yeah. terms of making friends? Because I know you're embarrassed about it, so... It annoyed me, only because I know I had the aptitude and the uh, to be decent at school, but I either couldn't stay awake or I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't do homework at night, and it just annoyed me that... I knew I could have done something, which I rectified the minute I got out and I, you know, graphic artist, went and got a degree and, and, and I, I, I caught up with everything that I missed out at school. So school was always, I loved school. It was something, and, and maybe it was because I wasn't at home that I enjoyed. I was comfortable with making friends, but I have to say, and I, 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 this lives with me today, I have this thought, why would someone want to be my friend? Is there an ulterior motive? I'm very guarded. Still. I'm, to this very day. Mm. I'm very guarded with making, because I know 
Is it an, is it an abandonment, abandonment thing? Do I feel someone, once again, is going to abandon me? Why make a relationship or a friendship with someone who I know is just going to disappear? Did you find that with finding love too? No. no. I was sort of lucky. Um, you know, mum came into my life when I was still at high school. You didn't have that same feeling of they're going to leave me or worries or insecurities or anything? No, I didn't, I've never had that with yeah. love. I've never had any concerns or anxiety or thoughts that she would leave or I would leave. It's never been a consideration. It's. Would you say the abuse just kept going until your dad passed? Was it, or until you guys moved? I think probably until the abuse obviously stopped when we left. At the time, did you did you recognise it as abuse? <coughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you're very aware that I, I never thought at any stage it was normal. I've just got tough love. This is more than yeah, that. Yeah, it's more than that. Yeah, um, it wasn't the physical stuff. It was, it was just the threat of violence. His presence. I mean, that, because I got out of the house that regularly and, and had sleepovers and met other people, I never thought at any stage when I compared those relationships and when I came home, I thought this is weird. Mm. I never thought at any stage this is how a family should be. Yeah, We had good times. I mean, I've talked about the times at home were bad, but when we went on holidays, they were good. Why is that? He was probably out of the house and we could get out because we always went camping. We went locked mm. in, 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 you know, behind four walls. But would he still drink when he goes on holidays? He would still drink. Mm. In fact, most of the holidays we went were centred around him finding part-time jobs at pubs. So we'd go to a place called Alexandra in New Zealand and he got a job at the nearby pub. We stayed at a place called Naseby. He got a job at the nearby pub. So during the day, he'd drink at the pub. I would get up in the morning and disappear for six, 12 hours like you guys used to do when you were camping, come home. But there didn't seem to be any violence when we were camping, so I enjoyed those moments. Mm. It was only seemed to be when he was working. I don't know what brought it on, the, 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 the pressure of work, I don't know, being locked behind four walls. But I know when we went camping, maybe, and I don't remember this, but maybe we went camping with some of his friends. There seemed to be a lot of people around, so maybe it was a group thing and, the, <coughs> and that was the outlet for him and... Yeah, he never resorted to any violence while we're out. Yeah, and and you and you touched on earlier how how your mum how badly she got it too. Yeah, looking back on it, can you put a reason to why she stayed? I think I know. I think I understand better now, but certainly not then. I was mm. angry. She did leave at one stage after one of the really serious episodes. She left, but then she had a mental breakdown and then came back. I think just. The concern of how she was going to manage the rest of her life, whether it be work, whether it be finance, whether it be housing. There was no, I couldn't imagine there being any, we're talking 70s, late 60s, I couldn't imagine there being any support network for domestic violence back then. And I think maybe she stayed together for the typical reason, for the, I stayed together for the kids. And that's what I put it down to. But now, and I shouldn't think this, I now feel angry for her doing that why the hell didn't she just leave? Things would have worked out. So I, I, I seem to have been more sympathetic when I left home and I spoke to other people and I read a bit. I went, oh, okay, that's the reason she didn't leave. She didn't think she would survive. With But now as I've got older and I find, and I've survived, and I know how I got through it, I think, well, if I got through it, why couldn't you? So there's a bit of anger for her there, a bit mm. of abandonment maybe. Mm. So that's some of the stuff that makes me angry is it could have been something we it could have been so much better even back then in the day. Because I hear people of our generation who did separate back in those days and they survived. Mum yeah. had her own business. She had her own shop. She was very successful. Yeah. So she could have made it work. Yeah. Whether she was under the threat of you leave and I'll come and get you, I'm not sure. Yeah. But that's probably another concern that might have been there. That fear factor, isn't the it? The fear yeah. factor. Oh, he, he will do damage mm. to her if she left. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just guessing, but that's probably an option. And was leaving New Zealand, I guess, a way for you to start fresh and put everything behind you? And It was interesting. I had it planned a long time. It was only going to be when I was ready to go, when I was financially right, mentally right. I knew what I wanted to do. I'd written down a list of jobs I wanted to have, which is weird, in Australia. And I think I mentioned the other day, I said, uh, it's interesting. I wrote down, I don't know, it would have been the last couple of years at high school, I wrote down on a list. Because someone else had gone to the mines in Australia and I'd written down, I want to go to the mines. 
I want to work in professional sport. What have been my, what's my last two jobs been? Mm. I work in the mines and I worked in pro- professional sport. I had a clear sight of what I wanted to do and then my oldest brother, Royce, he knew the situation, he knew what I wanted to do and he said, here's the money, get on a flight, come and live with me. So that got me out probably before I'd planned to get out. So he was my, he was my, my angel that got me out mm. earlier than I guess I'd planned. Your other siblings stayed in New Zealand, they my stayed others, there. So Gary had got married at that stage. I think Michelle, my youngest, and I, me were the last two at home. My oldest sister had got married. Royce had left. He left real early. He got out of town. He got out of Dodge at 19, I think. So he'd been out, so it was just me and Michelle left at home. And, you know, things weren't too bad at that stage. I was a bit older and a bit bigger. So I don't think, I don't recall too much. In the later years after I left school, so I didn't leave home until I was 21 maybe, or 20, uh, 21 maybe. I don't think much was directed towards us, Michelle and I, when, once I left school. But it was just the threat of violence existed in the air, so it, was, it got better. As you got older? As I left school, mm. I remember it being better. Was it hard leaving your siblings? No. No. I'd made that decision, I, 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 not at all. I knew why I was coming, although everyone said, I'll see you back. I was never coming back. I knew I wasn't coming back. Yeah. I was out and it, had, it saved me. I mean, suicide thoughts were in my mind every day. I was planning how to do it Yeah. Um, for as long as I can remember. Yeah. I doubt whether I would have been doing it as a young kid, but certainly at high school. Every quiet moment thinking, how would I do it? And that's, that scares me. Until I got clarity, until I... I guess until I got in late senior high school and I knew what I wanted to do, I knew my direction, I was getting out, I was going to Australia, maybe those thoughts stopped, but certainly early high school. In the thick of it. Mm. Early high school and I didn't have a clear plan. My, my escape plan wasn't in place. I couldn't think how I was going to get out of it. Mm. Um, suicide was certainly looked a pretty good option. Yeah. And how, how has it impacted your relationship with your siblings? I don't have any, um, unfortunately. And I guess it's mainly because I see them, I see him. My oldest brother has died when he was alive and my other two sisters. There's nothing getting away from the fact that, and me as well, we all have my father's characteristics, whether it's just the tone of our voice or... And I'm a different person. You ask mum, when I am with my family, I try so hard. Do you get anxious? Oh, completely. Yeah. Not on my stomach. Yeah. Not comfortable. Yeah. And that's the only reason. I'm sure they think I don't like them. Mm. Michelle, I see a lot of, oh, well, mm. once or twice a year. Mm. But I'm sure they think it's because I don't like them. It's just because it makes me feel so sick. Yeah. And maybe that's a conversation I need to have with someone to get over it. Um, I just see him there. They will deny they look like him or sound like him, but... I do. To you, yeah. I do. Yeah. That day we were back in New Zealand, Tom said to me, oh, you look like your father. Mm. Do you hate that? Oh, of course. Mm. Oh, dear me. Mm. That's a knife through the heart. Mm. I've got his bluntness. I've got his sternness. Sympathy and empathy is probably something that I'm, try- I'm trying to desperately work on. Mm. I've probably left it too late. You can tell me that. No, you never, it's never too late. Is that one of the things that's affected you the most is... Have you struggled with showing empathy? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, growing up with you kids, young mum would be the emotional one. If you hurt yourself, oh, darling, yeah, darling, you okay? Leave me alone. Is there, is, is there blood? No, don't worry about it. Is there blood? He's okay. I remember you fell off the couch and broke your arm. It was at right angles. Remember the breaking your arm? Mm. And mum was. Oh, she was really emotional. I walked away. She said, blood there, don't worry about it. That was me. I had in my mind that I had to be the strong one. I took it too far. Mm. I took it too far. And I see those faults and, you know. As strong as in not showing emotion. Yeah. Mm. I didn't want anyone to see a weak spot. If, you, if your dad saw a weak spot, he would, yeah. he would prey on it. Yeah. And mm. that's how he got to my other brother because my brother wasn't that strong. Mm. He had that emotional stuff and that's why he preyed on him. And so I always felt, oh, okay, to survive, I've got to be strong. If a decision had to be made or life had to be emotionless, then I was your man. Yeah. And I resent that and I regret that. And you may not remember, there's a lot of times when I just didn't get involved or didn't show you enough empathy if you were upset or concerned or 
I showed no patience and I could probably roll that a few of those times and it's just, mm. it burns me. What's been your process to move forward with your life? And I know coming to New Zealand and I know you talked about having a, a game plan bef- before coming to New Zealand of what you wanted to do. But what, what I want to know is what set you apart, I guess, from not going down that, down that same road. I think because of, I was strong and that's why I still am and that's how I believe that succeeds. I, I, was, I somehow developed that strong exterior that got me a game plan to get out of New Zealand. It got me, it galvanised my belief I was going to succeed come at all costs and it did at all costs. I, I made relationships with convenience. If it was going to work for me, I did. I had no trouble making relationships because of the sporting factor. It's easy to make relationships when you're playing a team sport. It was never a relationship probably because I liked you for who you are. It was more I liked you for what I can get out of it. So my survival instincts were there. And I had mental plans of how I was going to succeed. Failure was never going to be a long-term thing, but somehow short-term failures I enjoyed. When I was going for jobs or if I was going for a unit to live, I liked not getting it straight away. I somehow enjoyed fa- short-term failures. That way I, inv- I valued the long-term success better. If I got a success straight, of me, straight away, is it a dopamine thing? I don't know what it is. I sort of came out of a failure going, yes, that's one more, that's one less. I've now got nine left and I'll have somewhere to live or I'll have a job. Yep. So that's an odd thing I'd, someone would like to tell me why I think that. I know we spoke about it the other day, but I mean, you didn't have to learn to forgive and to move on. <coughs> you, you, you spoke earlier oh, the other day about using yeah. it as an indicator of how you want to be as a father. And that was one of the things I came away with. I, I struggle with forgiveness and forgetting to this very day. To this very day, I struggle with forgiving and forgetting, whether it's if someone's done me wrong, I struggle with that wow, this is weird. And that's probably why it still affects me because I didn't want to forget what happened to me when I was young. Because if I wanted to do something as a father with you guys or even as a husband, I always went, would my father have done that? And if it was a yes, then I wouldn't do it. And to this very day, I guess an example is alcohol. I I believe I don't have any dependency, but I'm scared that I do if I drank too much. So this very day, a couple of beers, I'm out of there. Yeah, because I remember growing up and we didn't see you drink. I don't know if that was a conscious decision to not show us, but I don't remember you. um, Well, you never did it around us anyway. I never really saw you and mum drink. It was conscious. I just didn't want it to be in the house. I never made a deal of it. It was nothing that, um, you know, when we went out, I would drink. But around the house, I didn't want you guys to think it was a normal part of life. And that's probably a leftover from that any sort of dependency on on alcohol and because of that it probably sits with me today you got to I'm a, I work in the mines a six pack sit in my fridge for a month mm. it's it probably still I don't don't know if that's a leftover from it or because I can't be bothered I'm not sure did it ever not make you want to start a family of your own were you scared of I was never scared of make, starting a family but I was conscious so conscious of being careful of what I did Keeping my, and I probably lost my patience and I've got anger things probably. I would have blown my top a few times, but I was so conscious not to do certain things and not having alcohol was one of them. But at no stage did I not want to have kids. But I certainly wanted to have kids when we were ready for for them. And that's why we had them late Mm -hmm. when I was 30. So, But I just want, yeah, I didn't want to put pressure on kids, but I was very clear and I was mentally planned. And ready to have kids, so no, no, I, 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 it was never a thought that we wouldn't have them. Did you ever have any deep anger issues? I think. Yeah. I think. You're talking about in relation with people who made me angry and not being able to control it? Yes. I mean, in any sort of... Yeah. There have been moments when I haven't been able to control my anger. Not probably, maybe since, maybe since you kids were born, I can't remember. But I know I've caught myself a couple of times when I first came over. Mm. I just, for no reason, I I couldn't stop myself from just unloading. And there have been, you know, I am obnoxious obnoxious and and I say things and and I can't let things go. So I've got some some one-upmanship desire. 
I struggle, and this goes back to me always wanting to be successful and succeed. I struggle to sort of let things go if I haven't had the last say or mm. I'm not winning an argument or I'm not right maybe. That's something that sits with me and that's probably the survival instinct that I've yeah, had to... that's what I was going to bring it back to, yeah. It comes back from there. I mean, I've had to win to succeed and I probably need to have another discussion with someone to get over that shit. I've had to win to survive, sounds like, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, I've like... had to win to survive because if I was a bit wishy-washy and, and a bit grey, I'm black and white. If I think this has to be done, no one's going to stop me from doing it. Mm. Uh, if I think it's right, I'm pig-headed. Even if I know it's not right. Stubborn. I think, I think it's right. Yeah, stubborn. Um, so, uh, sounds you, like someone just described me then. <laughs> and that's interesting, isn't it? I don't know how much is, is genetics and how much is um, society, mm. uh, how much do you feel or see growing up with a parent like that. So you take those beliefs and those, those characteristics. That's an interesting conversation. How has, how has mum helped you during this process and uh, supported think, you? Yeah, I think just she, she supported me in everything I've done. Because you guys have been together for how long? 45, 47. Yeah. We lived together for, you know. I'm sure there would have been some hard times. Cause she, was she aware of everything at the time? Not at once, I think. Of your childhood? Because she was around. When did you guys meet when you were 16, 17? Well, let's wind the clock back. This is one of the annoying things that I had to put up with. She never believed once what dad was like because dad was the nicest guy in front of other people. Mm. She thought dad was so nice and he liked her. He made sure he never drank when she was there and he was the most pleasant man. And that goes back to my footy mates. If I played a game of footy, he would always invite them back to our place for drinks and he'd put on all the booze. Mm. Always did. And all my mates thought he was great. And that's something that I just... I struggled to deal with, is that I was, I was an island. I was by myself being critical of someone that everyone else liked. And they didn't know. They didn't know. Mm. They, they had no idea what he was like. I've dropped a few things, and mum now is quite clear, I think, over the years. I didn't sit her down one day and drop the lot. Mm. She'll hear stuff today that I haven't told her. Did yeah. it cause a bit of a riff when she wasn't believing you of what, Happened? Were you a little bit? No, no. She may have thought that. Mm. You sure? Mm. She may yeah. Have, she may have thought that, but she never doubted or or or, or challenged me on things that I've said. Mm. She's just gone. Mm. Wow. Yeah. No. She's she's been she's been the constant. Yeah. In my life, and she supported me on everything that I've, every direction I've wanted to go, mm. and she's had to put up with my shit, mm. the stuff where I am apparently always right. Did I told myself that? She waits for you to leave the room and then she yeah, tells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and, that's, and, and that's good. I'm glad she vents when I'm not there. Mm. I'd hate to think she says nothing. No, no, she vents. Yeah, and that's good. But yeah, I, I am and I know that and I beat myself up trying not to be but mm. it catches me by surprise and I can't look back and go, oh, sorry about that. I struggle with that. I see apologies as weak unless you mean it. Yeah. Apologies have to come with... No conditions, and you have to understand why you did that and what are you going to do to fix it. Has there been any traits that, any positive traits that have given you from this experience? Uh, yeah, um, to succeed. To succeed. And not using, I've never once used what happened to me as a crutch or an excuse for failure. I've always twisted it and used what happened to me as a strength. I've got through it, I've survived, and my failing, my failures have been my own reasons, but it's driven me so hard to succeed, and if I've failed, it's no one else's excuse but mine. I never once said, I'm a bit broken, I'm mentally traumatised by domestic violence, that's why I failed. It's never happened. So the good things that have come out of it is I'm very strong-willed. Too much. Mm. Too much. Very stubborn. Very stubborn. Um, but I, I believe that going through hardship builds resilience in people and positive traits that I see in you, that you're extremely motivated, ambitious, and extremely resilient. You, if, there's any, if there's a problem that I think is a problem, it's always an opportunity for you to get better at something. You've never let it stop you from doing something. You've always worked it out. You've always 
you've always come up with a game plan to work something out. You've never... I almost think that you enjoy the hardship or the problems more. Yeah, I do. Um, and what I'm really interested in knowing is that how do you... When you have kids, the last thing you would want from your kids is to go through any hardship. But it's kind of a double-edged sword because at some point they have to go through some hardship to be resilient, to learn how to be resilient. Yeah. But it's hard as a parent to go, I want to do everything that my dad didn't do to me. So I want to be the exact opposite. But then I've created such a good, easy life for my kids. How do I instill resilience in them? Yeah, and, that, and that's been something that your mum and I have challenged with. Mum has always wanted to protect you guys from failure. Left to my, 100% to my own, if it was me, I would have exposed you to more failure and more hardship. Um, and I would have got you to embrace failure, but that was not something that mum ever wanted you guys to do, was experience failure, whereas I always thought it was a good character to have, is to problem solve, to learn how hard it can be, and then to achieve. This is a silly thought I've got. I hated so much primary schools giving trophies to everyone in the race. Participation. Participation. Mm. Life isn't participation. Mm. Life is winning. No one gets a trophy for getting last. I know it's all wrong. Psychologists mm. will probably lock me up. Mm. But I was always, in my belief, you don't get a trophy for getting last. You, encouragement, you need encouragement for getting first. And it's not to say, it's okay for getting last. That's fine. Mm. It's not life. Because the reason I brought that up, because I've done a, lo- a lot of reflection the last few years and I've been trying to figure out what, what makes me tick and the, some of the things that I struggled with was my relationship with failure. I hated failing. I hated failing so much that I would never try anything new. I knew that I would fail at it or I knew I wouldn't be good at it. So I would only stick to things that I know that I'd be good at. And like data, later down the track, it just stopped me from learning new things and stopped me from wanting to experience new things because I just did, never wanted to fail. I just stuck at something that I knew that I was good at and that would be it. And the hard work, whether you realise it or not, or mum realises it or not, I hated hard work. I've talked about this and they say, oh, well, you did, you know, you did so much playing rugby and all the trainings and driving down to Brisbane and all the commitments. That wasn't hard work for me. I love that. That was easy work. So I, I found there's a, there's a difference between hard work and working hard. So I, I worked hard at that, but it was, I loved it. It was easy. I hated hard work. So hard work was something that was uncomfortable, something I didn't know anything about, something that was new to me or unknown. I avoided that. Because of that, I didn't want to do any hard work in terms of what's happening with what's going on in my head. I avoided any sort of talks about what could be wrong or what I'm going through, my thoughts. Yeah, and it got to a point where I was trying to find excuses to how I was feeling. I would blame it on a relationship. I'm not happy because of a relationship. So I'd end a relationship and figure out that I'm still unhappy. And I would procrastinate and go, oh, well, it can't be me. It's got to be something else. So I would blame it on footy. And I'd stop playing footy and I'd still have these feelings. And I was just prolonging it. I was just didn't want to do the hard work. The hard work was trying to go deep inside and figure out, okay, what, what's the thing that's stopping me? What's the blockage? The reason I love footy so much was because for 80 minutes on a Saturday and for an hour or two on a Tuesday and Thursday, nothing else would be inside my head. So I'd be free of all the, all the noise, all the insecurities, all the fear of failure, the, all the doubts. And then it got to a point where I needed that more than just the Saturday, Sunday. So then I started doing drugs and I, for the first time in my whole life that I was able to relax fully and not worry about the past and not worry about the future. It was just, I was fully present and it almost became addictive, that feeling of, of having no anxious thoughts and no worries. And I was just for an, for an hour of a high, I'm just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go jump around a room. I'll just sit there and sort of feel how good it is that, is this what normal people feel like? I didn't know how different I was or, or I, did, I thought everyone sort of had these sort of anxious feelings and thoughts and then when I did drugs, I, I could just sit in a room. I remember mum asking me, she goes, doesn't it make you want to party? I go, I could just sit at a table like this and know that there's nothing going on upstairs. It got to a point where if I know that taking drugs is bad for me, 
I can't play rugby forever. So it's going to come a point in time where I can't keep using drugs to feel better. I can't, I can't keep playing rugby. So what am I going to do? And then, again, it just brought back to I don't, I don't want to do the hard work. I just didn't want I was scared of knowing what was going to come up. I was scared of how hard it was going to be to get, to get my head better. And I made a call probably in my 1920 that if I was going to keep feeling like this, I don't think I was going to make it out of my 20s. I made a decision that I'm just going to do play as much rugby, much rugby as I can and just do as much drugs as I can. At least that way I'm covering both ends that at least I'm ignoring this anxiety. I'm trying to get rid of this depression and I don't care what happens to my body because I don't think I'm going to make it out of my 20s. <sighs> So I ignored a lot of injuries that I shouldn't have, and it, yeah. And I remember one night in Brisbane. I can't look at you. I didn't plan it or anything, and I knew I had a lot of drugs that night. And I knew that if I take any more, I could be running the risk and on not waking up. And I just remember going, "Oh well, if I wake up." I wake up, if I don't, I don't. And I remember waking up, the whole day went past and that was a Saturday night, I woke up Sunday night on the floor and had a shower and went to work on Monday, like nothing happened. And instilled denial, like this was put it off to a big weekend or I had too much and it wasn't, again I didn't want to do the hard work, I didn't want to sit down and go hang on a second, that was, what was that? That was more than just a big weekend or a silly thing. I think that was more intentional than that. And then, and then later that year, I went down to Sydney for New Year's and then the same thing happened. I, I was still in that mindset of I don't care what happens to my body. I don't care what I put my head through. It doesn't matter because I'm not making it out of my 20s anyway. So it doesn't really matter what happens to me. Came back, had a, had a four or five days down in Sydney for New Year's and came back to Brisbane and I couldn't go to sleep. I hadn't had any sleep in five days and got to a point where I checked myself into hospital and I called you and mum. And you guys probably already know or have a feeling of, of what, I was, what I was doing. And I remember just laying, laying in the hospital bed and the nurse came around and sort of I had to tell her what was happening and what I'd taken. And she, I remember asking me, is everything good at home? Again, I lied to her and said, yeah, everything's, everything's fine. And then I had a, a chaplain came around and asked the same question to me. And I remember just laying there and I just thought of you and mum. And all the sacrifices and hard work that you guys did. I mean, mum worked a job for 30 something years, worked full time and. Raised three boys And I was just going to throw it all away Just because I didn't want to do the hard work <laughs> And I remember laying there Just thinking about you two And I just didn't want You know I was I was just What, what you said about thinking about how, Planning a suicide I, I It's really frightening how One little thought One little passing thought one day can can manifest itself into two two of those thoughts a month and a couple of thoughts every fortnight and then once a week and then every day and then you start thinking about how do I kill myself but also in a way that my parents can say goodbye to me. Um, what have you, so how have you got out the other end of this? What triggers have you done? What's happened to your life that has turned it around? Is, is stop playing rugby one of the big yeah. benefits? Yeah. Yeah, and I just remember laying in the bed in hospital and I just thought about you and mum. And, you know, some people go through rehab or some people go through, they talk to psychologists. But for me, it was a flick of a switch that day, that night. It wasn't something that I had to convince myself of. It was a flick of the switch. I remember laying in hospital. I was hooked up to IV, uh, IV drip. I was dehydrated. They gave me all this water to drink. Gave me Valium so I could go to sleep. I remember just laying there thinking of you two and just thinking, I, I, I'm not just going to be 
I'm not going to waste my life for no fucking reason. Um, and it was a flick of the switch the next, that week I moved back to the coast, got out of that environment, got back to the coast and just started, and then went to a psychologist and just to talk about it, because before then I had never spoken about it. Playing rugby was a big one for me. A big failure or a big, big success? So I always thought of it as a big failure. I thought I should have done more. I thought that my fear of failure hindered my performance. The pressures I put on myself to play, if I played a game of rugby and we lost, it's my fault. Regardless of what I did, if we played a game of rugby and we lost, it's my fault. If we played a game of rugby and we won, it's someone else. It doesn't matter how I played. If we won, it's someone else's good work. But if we lost, it's my fault. And I used pretty much you and mum as a motivator to try to do everything right that I should have done. So the mental recheck, is that still exist that you're, in, you're in now out the other end and you're using that as a positive and you're not using other external things as an excuse and hard work, you now realise that hard work is the only way you're going to... Yeah, I've just realised that, 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 that the hard work needs to happen. The, the life is going to catch up with you and you're not going to outrun it. You're not going to think... Um, I always thought that I would outgrow it. So I just thought it was a young thing. I just thought when I was 17, 16, 17, when it all started to happen and I remember, oh, it, I'll outgrow it. Or oh, I'll give it another year, it'll go. So I just thought it was time and I'll, I'll outgrow it. And time is a thing. Like you've got to be patient with it. Like when you start talking to people and start get everything, get everything on the right track, it's still going to take time. But if you're just relying on time to fix it, it's not going to fix it. No. So all I was relying on time and I was hopefully I was going to outgrow it. And then every year that went past. The mere fact that you have experienced everything that you've done, and, and the parallel could be what I've experienced. You've now got out the other end at 30. Now, a couple of years later, you can use that as a motivation. I mean, as parents, we, you did, right? We pretty much knew the one benefit of Facebook is mum stalks. So we pretty much knew there was things posted on Facebook, whether it was the Sydney trip or what happened in Melbourne, there was stuff posted on Facebook that we pretty much knew what you were up to. Whether you think we didn't? No, I didn't really think that you did. Yeah, we knew. We could do nothing about it. We couldn't talk to you because your defences were up. Uh, dealing with you any time since leaving high school, since you started playing serious footy, was always a challenge. It was never roll around the grass, have fun and laugh and giggle and take the piss out of each other. We couldn't do that with you. We always had to talk to you differently. All our conversations with you couldn't result in conflict it was so we could have a conversation with sam and talk about any shit that we wanted and it would always end up in laughter we couldn't do that with you so we always knew and and i guess i'm not i hate to blame contact sport as the reason that's probably the lowest hanging fruit so i will contact sport you know concussions and if you want to throw any high performance job into that you probably could other people's expectations of your ability and you trying to reach that, convincing you or convincing anyone that they're better at what they're doing than they are. I'm not saying that anyone is, but any time other people's expect- expectations exceed your ability and you're not reaching those, whether it be in a work, whether it be anywhere, puts unneeded and undue stress. In your case, it was a contact sport and, and, and my belief in any professional sport now is is uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in the welfare people are given. And I we ex- you may not remember it, but when you're in that Australian Sevens thing at one stage, you were you got injured and you were sent back up and I was working still with the Reds and I spoke to the manager, you came up injured, I think. And uh, I think I said something about, oh, his injury's coming up, so let's deal with it. We're not. Okay, then. Mm. So they may look after the top 30 in each team, but anyone after that, they don't really care. Mm. So I don't... And that's just probably any professional sport. I just think it's, it's cancerous. We knew what... Not the detail. We suspected a lot of things went... Happened to you and going by the Facebook posts. So we always had concerns, but we couldn't raise them with you because it would be a conflict situation. It was definitely eggshells with you when you were home. You did not want to talk to us. Whether you're still going through that, I'm not sure. 
how do you feel now? Are you happy in your own life, in your own mind, or are there still dark times? No, no dark times. No, nothing. No, the thing that I... It's a bit like you when, you when you go through those hard things. It makes you appreciate everything you do have. I needed to go through it. I, I put myself in that position by not being brave enough and having enough courage to talk about it and not going trying to go through that hard work earlier. And I just thought I was always going to avoid it. This hard work thing, was that as long as you can, yeah. can remember? Yeah. Well, I hated hard work. I'll work out something that I'm good at. So shortcuts, shortcuts, are the way you want to go. Shortcuts. When I was growing up, I'll do any sort of shortcut. Oh, I won't do anything that is uncomfortable for me. So what did I play? Keep playing rugby for? It was easy. It was easy. You're good at it. It was. It was kind of like an ego thing. I know that I'm good at it. I know that it's comfortable. When you were given the opportunity, when you're in Brisbane to pick up a trade, remember there was a. You worked with that company and you offered a boilermaker. You had the choice. You spent a month doing different trades mm. and you had the opportunity to do something while you were still playing mm. and you didn't. And I was gone, mate. Mm. doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Mm. That's just my cold black and white. Mm. Not, there's more something deeper than this. It was just my response was, doesn't he want to work? But so. yeah, it's, it was more, it's more the hard work. Yeah, it translates to a lot of things in life, like not going to do the hard work. But it, it, was, it was always that mental battle of getting over the fear of failure, the fear of starting something new and knowing you're going to be shit at it for a good year or however long. And I hated that. Whereas now, this scared the shit out of me doing this sort of stuff. But I know that it's something that I really like. It gets me out of bed in the morning. And what I've learned from everything that's happened to me that I'm really grateful for everything. How I am now is, is I'm glad I went through all that shit. I'm glad that I got to a point where that night could have gone either way. And I still hold, I still have, I think it'll always be with me. I still hold a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of embarrassment from putting myself in that position and almost costing, almost putting you through something that you tried so hard to forget your whole childhood. And you've worked so hard to put all that behind you and, and, and be so positive with your life. And I was almost about to drag you straight back into it again. Almost one of the reasons why it was so difficult talking to you when you, when you were saying it's, it was walking around eggshells with me is I was scared to talk to you. I was, I was wanting to keep my distance um, do you think this? So, do you feel everything? A lot of the things that we get out of childhood is environmental. So, your upbringing, your people around you, your experiences, how we spoke to you, how we treated you. Is there anything you can think of that you took out of childhood that is a negative from your parents and siblings? Yeah. I, when you talk about being strong, you want to be strong for the family. After thinking about it, when you're a kid, your greatest. Your first teacher and your, probably your greatest teacher is your parents. Yeah. So all I saw from you and mum is if any conflict had happened or anything from the past, you guys would hide it yep. to try to protect us. Yep. So I learned from that. Yep. So if you had anything going on, the, what what'd you see your parents do? They would protect you and hide it. So as a kid, you'd protect it and hide it. Yep. So if, 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 there's any, if there's parents listening and... And there's something I could pass on as a child is that showing strength is being vulnerable. I, I did not asking you to sit me down and tell you tell me everything about your childhood, but at least let me see you vulnerable. Show me how to do it. I never, even with mum, it wasn't just you. You guys were so strong and not showing emotion, but I needed someone to show me how to be vulnerable. I needed someone to show me how to talk when it's difficult and talk when it's painful and speak when it's when you're so uncomfortable but do it anyway all I took from what I took from you and mum is is to be strong because that's your survival mechanism is to be strong and that's just what I did I just saw you guys would hide things from us to protect us and I just thought well that's maybe that's what you got to do if I could reset the clock and it's interesting that that's one of the comments you that's one of the feelings you bring out because it's one of the feelings I have as well. I didn't open my heart enough. Um, you're dead right. Any issues that mum and I had, we would close the door and have a discussion for another day because we didn't want to expose you kids. But I hear other parents 
And kids, eh, my parents are arguing all the time. Yeah, even <laughs> really recently. Because mm. uh, you go, no, I've never heard my parents argue. Because we didn't. We took it outside or we took it for, had it for another day when we, we didn't expose you kids. And yet, getting the learnings from that helps you through life because life isn't without arguments, isn't mm. about disagreements. And that's one of the things I, we're well aware of. Um, and I guess that's a protection thing. We wanted you guys, given where I'd come from, we wanted you guys to see the nuclear family that was perfect and wonderful and well-fed and mm. well-catered for and no arguments. Mm. And uh, I guess if you're talking about a pendulum, one swing of the pendulum was me at the other end growing up and we sort of took it back the other way. We didn't find a happy, happy medium. We just, mm. we just didn't want to expose you to that. Yeah, and there's that, I don't know if you heard that saying that hard times create tough men, tough men create good times, yep. good times create... Weak men, weak yeah. men create hard times. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm not I'm not embarrassed by saying this, but your hard times created a tough man. You created good times. Yep. Those good times created a weak man. Yeah. And I'm not ashamed by thinking that that all the good times that you created. I know that that's all you wanted to do, but I felt like I didn't have much resilience growing up. Correct. I. If any, like I said, anything hard came along, I'd fucking go the other way. And we see that, and we did too much. We talk about it. We sort of, you know, we were there for every rugby game. We drive you down. No, get on a bus, mate. Find some other way of getting down. Mm. We made it so easy mm. um, for all three. Dealing with the pain of failure is is something. I think Mum brings that to the party. She believes failure. She won't try things. So if you got, so if it's, you know, if it's something that. Uh, comes through the genes of a genetic, I'll blame mum. You've got mum's genes. Because she will not do anything that she thinks she might fail at. Nothing. Mm. Screwing in a screw, hammering a nail, can't mm. do that. Give it a crack. Failure's good. Mm. No, I can't do it. And even go, going for jobs, I can't do that. You can do that. But you're right. If I had my time again, we need to expose, as part of the learnings of parents, we've got to expose their kids to everything they're going to experience when they, mm. when they leave home. And one of them is failure. Yeah, and it's not just the fighting. Like we don't see you guys fight. It, it was. It's more about sitting us down and telling us something that's happened to you that puts you in a vulnerable state. So you've shown me how to do it, and it gives me courage to do it. Oh yeah, Dad's told me a little bit, but his childhood was really rough. Or if I ever ask, where, why don't we see your grandparents? And just you don't have to say you know everything that we've talked about today, but you can go into some detail and some on some level be open and vulnerable with us at an early age, then I can say, oh, well, that's... Dad showed me how to do it. That was my biggest fear, yeah. being vulnerable. Yeah. I just could not afford to show it. Mm. And that was just that reaction from my childhood. Yeah. I didn't want to show a chink in the armour. I wanted you to, you to look up to me and say, well, he's strong. He's got through. You, you, talked, you mentioned earlier that you had to talk to me differently. Yeah. Do you think it's because of the amount of concussions that I... We suspect that, being self-diagnosed. I think that's just because that's, we can understand that, but it could be something else. But for us, um, being such a, an, a, an anti-contact sport now, I'm just using that as an excuse, but it could be something different. We certainly couldn't speak to you the same way we spoke to Fletch or Sam. And they are the same. Sam's very guarded. He, can't, he knows he can't speak to you. In a certain way, or even at all. And he talks about the times when you and him were living there, and he said we lived there for a year, and I don't know if I spoke to him the whole time. Mm. You'd walk into your room, and that would be it. He said it was the weirdest house, sharing house situation, given it was his brother. Because, you know, I just wanted to prep, and I wanted to understand how everyone feels, and he said, yeah, living here was so weird. So I think we all felt that. It was just something that we, whether you were like that with your friends, maybe not. Certainly with us, and I only and I only remember it as you got further and further into your rugby career. So that's why we just linked the two together: concussion, mm. rugby. I don't know when you started taking drugs. Whether there was a link there somewhere, I'm not sure. But I certainly remember the last time we were home it was very awkward. How come this situation has got so far without a discussion being had? And, and you said. Probably we haven't taught you to have an open discussion. So had we taught you to have an open discussion, Mum or Dad, I want to talk to you about something, you probably would have sat down. But had you, had you experienced us doing that, 
maybe you would have. But I, I remember that time and I just I wasn't at a place where I I started to be self aware of everything. I was still in denial about everything. It only started to come good for me in the last two years where I've actually recognised and been comfortable enough to op- to be to be self critical and not in an unhealthy way but realise, all right, this is these are the issues that's going on with me and be open to open to talk about it. Whereas before I was just in denial, I was like, This is Do you think you have anger management issue? Do you think I've said to you that I remember situations, or at least one anyway, but probably more, that I have lost it and I've got no idea yeah. what I'm saying yeah. and I cannot stop myself. I know, I know four times the top of my head where I have, I've lost it and I haven't lost it for a day. It would probably take three or four days for me to, to calm down and I would hang on to it. Yep. Yeah, three or four times in the last five years maybe. The first three played it off like it was a usual thing and then the fourth one I remember it really hit me going this is it scared me and again I, I I was doing the process of trying to figure out what makes me tick and then this happened and it really made me self-aware of something's not right this isn't just a, a short fuse like why am I why is this anger lasting three or four days why can't I let it go and that's what sort of pushed me in the direction of uh, I think it's I think that either the concussions have had a a huge impact on me because I've had a few or it's something that's always been there, whether it's a mood disorder or or some sort of bipolar. But, and I asked, I asked Benny Radmore, I said, have I always been a bit moody? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we can tell straight away whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood for the, you know, we can tell straight away. And I went, for how long? And he went, always. And I go, you haven't said anything like this to me before. And he goes, oh, we just, that's just you. You're in a good mood or in a bad mood, and we can tell straight away. So, so can your parents. Yeah. You walk in the front door, and we go, run and hide. Yeah. Don't even start a conversation. Yeah. We know we can't talk to you. Don't even... Mum, we know it, but mum always tries. Mm. How is your day today? <laughs> so... There's always an attempt by her, but I don't even go there because I guess I've been there, so I know there's absolutely no point. And I'm in the background going, don't don't say anything. Mm. It's your persist. So do you think, your mum think there's something? Oh, yep. Mm. Too scared to ask. Mm. We knew for a very long time. And I'm using, I think, see we, I know I'm using the concussion thing, but I think it even happened before you got seriously into rugby. Oh, it might have happened when you were 20, maybe. You left school at 18. You did get serious, but I'm sure all those concussions didn't happen that early. But it wouldn't surprise me if it's not just concussion. If there is some sort of bipolar thing there, I'd be interested to see what comes out of it. Mm. Does violence come with it as well, or just... No. It's, mm. Yeah, so we long... And I do know you're not a hard worker, and this is a silly... Ex- <laughs> this is probably a silly uh, example. But I know you started goal kicking at rugby as well. Mm. I took you down to the park one day. Had a few balls, kicked them over. You were shit. I think I might have told you. Picked the balls up and went. Never saw you kick a ball again. I thought, that's weird. <laughs> that's hard work, I know. But, gee, give it a, give it a, mm. give it a crack, mate. Mm. Would have taken you 10 years. But you would have been good got it. there. Would have got there. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we have recognised... And we tried to work it out because we had a fair idea where this was going to go. So we tried to think, when did, it, when did his anxiety, when did his behavioural patterns change? And we just think it was probably, you know, towards the end, if not the end of high school and then from then on. Do, do you believe that you can pass down trauma to your kids? Are you talking about genetics? I'm talking genetics. I am because I, I, I had the best childhood because of you and mum. I've got no bad memories. I've got nothing that would make me feel any sort of ill feelings or anx- being anxious. Being, I was never scared. Uh, the house was always, we always had food. It was always peace at home. Always had fun. And as I got into my teens, I was trying to figure out, well, why am I heading down this road? Well, what's, what's affecting me like this? The only thing, you know, and over the years I've done my Dr. Google to see if, a lot of things are generational. 
whether it be alcoholism, whether it be mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, I mean, we're thrown all those things at my father. So is it genetics? Can it be, can it be handed down? And then half of them will say it can, half of them will say it can't. So mm. I don't know if trauma can be handed down. I think you've got to experience trauma to, 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 to be affected by it. Mm-hmm. But certainly maybe mental illness can be an issue, can be something that... Yeah. I know there's been a lot of stuff done around it, but I might, don't think it's black and white. Mm. I know all the issues in our family it would, it would be a result of trauma, um, whether it be my older sister, my Michelle, or uh, I think that's because we've all experienced such bad trauma that we're all pretty broken. Yeah. And it's how we deal with it and how we move on um, mm. that either gets us through life or doesn't. The downward straight for you. This is, I guess, that was the hard bit. What's your? It was good because I prepped for the hard bit. Did you? Oh yeah. You didn't even need the. You didn't even need the toilet paper. I did last night. Oh, did you? Mum and I both needed. Oh, you got it out of it last night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to do it for the camera. Yeah, I know. We knew where it was going. Oh, did you? Oh yeah. Um, well, Mum knew where it was going years ago. <laughs> your, I, I want to know what gets you out of bed in the morning at sixty-seven years old. Okay, and that's my biggest concern in retirement, mm-hmm. and I've obviously thought about this so much, and I've planned for retirement. What gets me out of bed at the moment is planning for my future. I have goals. I always have to have goals. I have to have targets short. I've got them written down. I've got to hit those marks, short, mid, long. Um, what we're doing in Tom Price, and that's a hard thing, leaving everyone and going, I'm out of here. Mum said, I want to go, but I can't go now. Um, I've got things, okay, I'll go, six months later, you come over, but I'm out of here, because that was part of my plan. So getting me out of bed now is, we're planning to renovate the house, I've got, we've got two world trips to go to, North America, back to Greece, we're going to do all that stuff, so I've got to have those goals, I've got to understand why I exist. My biggest fear in life is getting out of bed, and the highlight will be having a coffee or going to the bowls club. Mm. I can't tap out that early. I've got plans to get to 90, and I'm going to fill those next 20 odd years with mm. fun. How has children made you a better person? What lessons have we and other brothers taught you? Gee, I wish you'd taught me more. Um, I'd like to say empathy and sympathy, but you didn't do a very good job there. You've taught me, and what you've given me is compassion and love. I have no. I love cuddles. I love holding you kids. I didn't have daughters, but it does not matter. You're gorgeous, you're beautiful, and I love... And that's... Oh, we're going back down that trail again now. That's what upset us the most when you were in your shut-the-family-out mood. And you've said it to us many times, I've got to have a Hagen detox. Get away from the Hagens. That used to upset Mum and I so much because mm. we just wanted to cuddle. Mm. As long and as hard and as often. So if it's taught me anything, it's taught me compassion and love. Um, I wish you'd taught me more. Treat people better. Empathy, sympathy. So from that context, you didn't do a very good job there. I'm sorry, you failed. (laughs) You could have done better. But they're the two critical things, I think. Mum's trying hard to teach me other things, but she's failing too. Do you have trouble asking for help? Oh, always. Mm. Can't, can't ask for help. Mm. Unless it's life or death, I want to fail or succeed under my terms. I, as I said before, I don't mind failing as long as I fail because I, it was my fault mm. or I wasn't good enough. And if I succeeded, I wanted to say I did it on my own terms. I don't want to say I did it because someone else helped me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, did you notice that growing up? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. I had to do it in my own terms, and yeah. pouring a whole sla- pouring a whole concrete driveway, <laughs> mate. There's a whole forty team could have helped you. No, no, no doing it. I'm doing it. Mm. Not would, good. Would you ever consider seeing a psychologist about your past? Or is yeah, listen, w- w- that's something I'll have to do. Mm. I'll have to do it if I want my twenty years of retirement to be enjoyable. I'm mm. going to have to get deal with things because. You know, when you're working, you see your partner or wife or husband three or four hours a day. In retirement, we could be seeing each other 24-7, 365. One of us isn't going to make it. (laughs) 
<laughs> so of yeah, no, we've discussed it. We yeah. are going to see someone because I need to be able to. Holidays for me aren't really holidays for me. Mm. Lying on a beach or sitting around doing nothing, unheard of. I've got to find a switch. Mm. And if it's a mental switch, that's fine. I, you know, I work six and six, and on my six days off, I've got to work. Mm. I go and help other teams out. Yeah, and it's going to come a point in time where your body can't allow you to do that, so you've got to figure out what the switch is. Guess what? What? The time's here. The time's here already. Yep. Yeah. So I've got to do it. So, yeah, I, yeah um, what gets me out of bed is the future gets me out of bed. Yeah. What do you remember of your childhood? Is it, is it all good or bad, bit of both? And looking back on it, do you feel like you've lost a fair chunk of your childhood? Yeah, absolutely. I'm angry and mean and horrible because not only have I lost it, your kids have lost it as well because you don't have any connection with relatives. The whole, yeah, I have nothing. I might pull out, I love camping, and that was always a good experience because we didn't seem to get beaten up when we were camping. So that's a good feeling, but there's nothing about my childhood that I, I enjoyed really. Maybe it gave me exposure to a million sports, but no. Mm. It's more to do with what you kids have missed out on. No grandparents and uh, no cousins. We see them, but Hell there's yeah. no relationship there. Yeah. What makes you proud of yourself? Having got out, yeah. having reset the clock, having um, broken the cycle. Um, I've still got, um, you know, I've still got bits and pieces that I can't get rid of, but the fact I got out, you guys got out without me continuing that cycle of violence. I'm proud of that, deeply proud of that. I've got a successful marriage. Mum may <laughs> challenge that point. You've got a marriage. I've got a marriage. <laughs> What's the story go? I've had, a, I've had a successful marriage for 30 years. We were married for 45 years, but only 30 was successful. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's, it's a constant thing that I've got to work on. Oh, you know, and as I said, when, you, when we go home in retirement and we're with each other, it's a different world, and that's where I think I need to get someone to help me mm. in a house with Annie, mum, a lot longer than I see her now, so it's... Yeah, I've got to deal with those things. Yeah. If you could go back in time and tell me that young 13-year-old Brent something or give some, some, give some advice, what would it be? Uh, probably you will survive. Mm. You will get out um, and there is a better life. And don't be so anxious and don't take yourself so seriously, which I do to this very day. Mm. I think I'd tell him that. That would have made me a lot better, a lot better person, and uh, maybe try and get out a bit earlier. I got out at 21. I could have got out a bit earlier. Yeah. So we're at the end of the, the podcast, yep. and I've got a, got a closing tradition of the podcast Yep. where I don't ask the last question. I get a loved one, a friend, a family member, someone that means a lot to you. They write in a question, and it's something like, the, something they've always wanted to ask you or something they've always wanted to say to you. So we've got mum, your wife, my mum, <laughs> and it might, go, it might be along the same lines as what you're proud of. She wanted to know what's your greatest achievement in 67 years. I guess I've answered it. I guess um, still being married to mum, given what she's had to put up with, my oddities, that's... And raising three, three boys um, who, and I don't look at your, I don't look at what you, has happened to you as a failure. But I think we've got three boys who have experienced things in life um, that I think at the end of the day will be positives. So I think we've taught them. A, I was going to say good work ethic, but you haven't got that <laughs> apparently. <laughs> but I think getting through life, we're comfortable now. Um, I've broken the cycle of violence. I'm proud of that, and I think given I've done it by myself without any help from anyone else. I'm proud of that. Sometimes it can be generational and, ha- and continue, which has happened in other families close to me, so I'm proud of that. Sam's your firstborn? 
You just answered it. Do you admire yourself for stopping the physical abuse in one generation? Yes. He's got another one that says, do you see being emotional as a weakness or a negative trait? Wouldn't you consider anger the same? Wow. Yeah. And I've chosen just one above the other. Anger is definitely weak, and I know that, and I get angry when I show it. Mm. It rips me apart, but I can't show it to anyone else. I'll, I'll, I'll explode, and I'll go, God damn it. Mm. But then I can't go back and apologise and go, oh, sorry. Mm. Um, I wish, yeah, time again, I wish I'd shown emotion. Um, Susie has sent something in who was married to your oldest brother, Royce. And she said that Royce tried really hard to be a father figure to Brent and his siblings to try to protect them from his father's abuse, which is why Royce paid for Brent to come over to Australia in 1976 and try to give him a better chance at life, which is probably why Brent has been so positive and made the most of his opportunities because he could have gone a different direction. Correct. 100%. One hundred percent. I didn't realise he did that for that reason. I just thought he's being a good bloke. But you did right, and that's what I said. He was my, he was sort of my angel that got me away. He left for his own reasons at nineteen, but he came back and he saw what was going on, and he looked at me and said, "Because I had said to him at the time, I'm out of here." He said, "No, you're out now. Here's three hundred and fifty bucks. Get on a plane, come and live with me." So I lived with him. So you did right. He got me out. He said. Yeah, I've got no idea when I would have got out, whether whether I would have got out, but knowing what we know now, he probably saved me from uh, any bad stuff that could have happened. Mm. And I'm just going to share with you the final thing, my favourite memory of you. And it's probably something that you wouldn't expect, but it's something that I can never forget. And when I used to... Um, in the back garage, I used to have the Xbox in there. Yep. I was either playing Ricky Ponting Cricket or yep. Rugby 08 or something, and there was a couch behind me. Yep. You know where this is going? Yeah. Oh, I don't know where it's going, but I remember. And you used to come in and, and lay on the couch while I'm playing and turn all the sound off, and I would play that song, Watch Over Me. Ah, I still listen to it. It's on my playlist. And you would lay there in silence eyes closed and then the song would end if you haven't heard it it's a great song the song would end and then you would go Elliot play it again yeah I know and you'd do it about five or six times and I'm playing with games and I'm looking back at you and you had your head back on the pillow and you go play it again that's one of my favourite memories I have of you Had to go there. <laughs> I tried. I've got to be strong. Okay. I can't show. It. I can't show weakness. Do you want a hug? <laughs> I probably need a detail.